I want to read a passage out of Ephesians chapter 6, familiar one, verse 1 to 3. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You know, it's interesting to note that we live in an age where we have established a day where we honor mothers. We have taken something that is basically a religious concept and we've put a date on it. We've commercialized it for the purpose of profit. Another example of this sort of thing is Christmas. You know, Jesus, the birth of Jesus, documented fact in the Bible, but the world had created a festival out of it, made it the engine that drives the economy of half the businesses in the world. honors commerce more than, than Christ, actually. And Mother's Day is kind of the same thing, to honor one's mother, that's a commandment from God found in the Old Testament, Exodus 20, 12. And it's in the New Testament as well. Jesus, if you didn't realize it, Jesus mentions this command in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and Paul does it right here in Ephesians chapter six. So society has picked up on this theme turned it into a profitable day of cards and gifts. Now, hey, don't get me wrong, I don't want to be a downer here. I'm not against the idea of a special day for moms, absolutely not. I just want you to realize that it wasn't man's idea. Man only figured out a way to make money with God's idea. God's the one that said we should honor our, our parents, our mothers, our fathers. I have another question. Did you ever wonder why God gave this command to honor father and mother in the first place? He said to do so would bring blessings on the children, but why was the command needed anyways? Well, I believe He did it because of His mercy. He knew that after Adam's sin, it was not going to be easy being a mother. And here's why. It was not easy being a mother because giving birth was not going to be easy. In the perfect world of the Garden of Eden, giving birth would have, if we can imagine, would have been natural and joyful and relatively easy. But after the sin of Adam, however, God declared that this process would become very difficult and painful. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, it says, or God says, to the woman God said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. God himself said it would be painful. Now God has designed woman to conceive and to bear children. And regardless of any other gift or talent that a woman may have and develop, the ability to bear children is primary for her as an individual. Her biological and psychological makeup are directly tied to this fact, regardless of the career she may choose to exercise in this world. Whatever ways you know, science can develop to engineer human conception and development, a woman Conceiving and giving birth to a child is and will always be a far superior method for human reproduction and social order. Now for various reasons, it doesn't always work that way, of course, of course. But I suspect that all women, if they choose and desire to have children, would much prefer having their own children. This basic role as life giver has been from the beginning a painful process. Carrying children, bringing them into this world, nursing them to the point of independence is filled with pain and discomfort and inconvenience. And thousands of years and thousands of medical advances later, childbearing remains painful and many times dangerous. 
If for no other reason the commandment to honor one's mother was established to acknowledge her pain in giving us life. That's just one reason and it could be the only reason and it would justify honoring our mothers. It's not easy being a mother because mothers are wives and being a wife would mean in God's eyes submission to a man. I mean the sin of Adam not only separated man from God but also destroyed the balance in the relationship that existed between man and woman before sin entered the picture. Before the fall God appointed that both man and woman rule in cooperation over the creation. Their natures were different but their positions were the same. However after their sin the weakness of their flesh would cause them to use their different gifts in sinful ways. The man would use his natural strength to dominate and to obtain with force what was once granted freely. And woman would use her natural complexity to usurp the position once equally granted to her. For this reason God assigned the role of submission to the woman and the role of struggle, we always forget that, the role of struggle to the man. We read again in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 it says, in pain you will bring forth children, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule, rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree about which I commanded you saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you were dust and to dust you will return. It would never be easy being a mother because this role would be tied to the difficult task of submitting one's will to another imperfect human being in order to demonstrate faith in God, in order to establish peace in the home, and in order to guarantee order socially. We need to honor mothers because they've given their bodies up in order to produce ours, and they've humbled their wills in order to produce what we call family. And it's not easy being a mother because mothers have to watch their children suffer and sometimes die. You know, it's bad enough that there is great pain necessary to bring a child into the world, but mothers also have to experience the pain that their children feel in their lives as well. You know, one thing I've learned in counseling, there's no medicine there's no counseling technique that can neutralize that thing inside of a mother that enables her to feel what her child feels and sometimes long before and after the child feels it. From the beginning, mothers have had to suffer because of what their children did and what was done to their children. For example, just in the Bible, Eve agonized over the murder of one of her sons by another one of her sons. Sarah suffered a lifetime because she watched another woman bear the child that she wanted and then died without seeing a wife for the son that she finally had. Hagar wept over the danger of death that threatened her only son Ishmael as they were banished from Abraham's household. Leah witnessed the rape of her daughter Dinah by Shechem. Moses' mother had to abandon her child in order to save his life. Samuel's mother gave him up because of an oath. Bathsheba watched her child die because of her sin. Job's wife experienced the death of all her children in one moment. And Mary, observed her eldest son Jesus humiliated, tortured, 
and publicly executed by the very people that he had loved and helped and healed. There is no greater pain imaginable than for the one who gave you life to watch you waste the life that she gave you or to see someone else take that life from you. Mothers deserve honor because no one experiences the pain and hurts that life brings longer or more deeply than those who bring us into this world and who sometimes experience the heartbreak of having to see us leave as well during their own lifetimes. Children, honor your father and mother indeed, for this is right in the Lord, because giving birth is difficult and being a wife is humbling and seeing you suffer is always painful. You know, God is so wise in that He created life in such a way that a woman was originally created by taking a part from a man. And then from then on, all men have come from women. This beautiful cycle repeats itself in so many ways in our lives. The experience of caring for our children and then having them honor and care for us in old age, this is good and this is right in the sight of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, he says, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Notice he said, children and grandchildren, two generations down. So with this in mind, I want to finish this very brief lesson by sharing with you a wonderful story from a children's book written by Canadian author Robert Munch, illustrated by Sheila McGraw, something I've shown you before, entitled Love You Forever. And we use this this morning with permission from Firefly Publishers. This little book expresses so beautifully the wonderful love of a mother and the loyalty and the tenderness that this love can create in the heart of her children. We'll watch this little video and I will come back with some closing comments. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old, and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And when Grandma visited, he always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had strange friends and he wore strange clothes and he listened to strange music. Sometimes the mother felt like she was in a zoo. 
But at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. That teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. One day she called up her son and said, you'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. When he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song. I love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. Then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Today we've tried to uh, demonstrate in a very small way why mothers deserve honor. Not only this day, but every day for their very special role in God's plan for life. I'd like to close this lesson by offering an invitation to those who see a need in their lives to be not just right with God, but right with their moms. Maybe moms right with their children or moms right with their grandmom. You know, it works. The relationship is connected in, in so many ways. So if you've not confessed Jesus and been baptized, well, of course, Please come and receive forgiveness in the waters of baptism. And if you need to be restored of sin or unfaithfulness, you need to identify perhaps with this congregation, this family, this church, of course, come and identify, come for prayer. But if you need prayer to be a better mom, or maybe better to your mom, and if there's something between you and your mom, let it go today. Just let it go today. And I'll say this added thing. Even if your mom is gone and you still have something, let it go. Let her rest in peace. After watching my own wife deal with our children, I know for sure she has done the very best that she could. She has tried the hardest. So if you need to be right with your mom, with your grandma, you don't have to come forward. That's between you and her. That's between you and God. But let this Sunday, let this moment be that time when you walk out of here with a clear conscience and a clear heart and a right relationship 
with that most important person in your life. We're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm sure you're familiar with what takes place now. If you need prayer, if you need to come forward for whatever reason, then we encourage you to do so as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.